Palestinian human rights organizations have been facing Israeli threats after pushing a case at the International Criminal Court. Death threats were recently made against rights activists who are seeking to hold Israeli leaders accountable for atrocities committed against Palestinian civilians in the Gaza Strip. Staff of Al-Mizan Center for Human Rights, along with three other groups, have been facing a campaign of attacks. They accuse Israel of war crimes in the besieged Strip mainly during the 50-day war and summer 2014. Our members received death threats, especially those who were collecting evidence or preparing cases against the Israeli war criminals. A number of right organizations have received multiple threats. They include Al-Mizan, Al-Haq and others. Even a prosecutor of the international court has received similar threats. Palestine officially joined the ICC in April 2015 and immediately filed complaints with the court. Tel Aviv has rejected any responsibility for the war crimes and just recently cleared Israeli soldiers of killing Gazan civilians during the 2014 onslaught. The whole judiciary system Israeli, in, in Israel is a cover-up on war crimes committed by the uh, Israeli uh, army against Palestinian civilians and Palestinian property. So nothing new. We are not surprised by closure of investigations, dismissing dismissal of cases, uh, by the uh, conclusions that uh, no war crimes committed. Uh, this is what has been uh, expected. Israel's wanton attacks in 2014 included the bombardment of civilian populated areas, the UN buildings, and other structures protected by the Geneva Convention. Such attacks have been the pattern of the previous Israeli offensives against the Gaza Strip. During the 50-day war alone, Israeli forces killed nearly 500 Gazan children alone. But despite this, it has not taken responsibility for its vicious attacks against civilians. Ashraf Shanan. It was a day to weep and remember in Italy Saturday, as the country held a day of national mourning for victims of Wednesday's devastating earthquake. Rescue workers continue to search for survivors, but more than three days have passed and time appears to be running out. Approximately three dozen caskets, some holding children, were aligned in neat rows and surrounded by relatives as a public funeral service was held in a community gymnasium, one of the few structures in the area still intact and large enough to hold hundreds of mourners. Italy's president, Sergio Mattarella, and premier Matteo Renzi joined hundreds of residents in mourning the dead. The local bishop urged residents to hold on to their courage and rebuild their communities. The bishop recalled the story of a nine-year-old girl, Giulia Rinaldo, buried in the rubble, whose embrace apparently allowed her younger sister, Giorgia, to survive. Giulia morta, Giorgia viva. As the mass concluded, emergency workers carried little Giulia's coffin out of the gymnasium. Mourners applauded in Italy's traditional way of honoring people who died in a tragedy. Meanwhile, rescue workers continued their desperate search for survivors, working with search dogs, special equipment, and hearing the sounds of moving rubble beneath their feet. Ned Barker, The Associated Press.
geldiğini duyabiliriz ki şu anda her şekilde yansımıştır yine Türkiye tarafından bir topçu ateşi gerçekleşti ve o ateşte e, ateş gerçekleşti. E, gördüğünüz gibi ileride bir mayının imha edildiğini e, sanıyoruz. Şu oradan yine o bulutları çıktı ki o bölgede yoğun olarak toplum bir çalışmanına başlandı. O bölgeye işit tarafından döşenmiş mayınlar oldukça yüksek. Elimize ulaşan bir süreyi aktarıldım ben sana. Ee, hava harekatı e, özellikle bu gece insan kurulmasının ardından ve bir şehitin e, bir askeri şehit olmasının şahsında olmasının ardından hava harekatı başladı. Sabah saatlerine karşı da bu hava harekatının yoğunlaştığını söyleyebiliriz. E, zaman zaman F-16 uçaklarının seslerini de duyuyoruz. Yine cevap olsun üzerinde e, hareket ediyorlar. E, o bölgedeki hangi hedefleri kurduklarına ilişkin henüz henüz elimizde net bilgiler yok. Ancak orada bir hava yoğunluğu olduğu süremizde yarar var. Geceden bu yana 80 civarında topçu atışı yapıldı. Yerel kanaklar onun için bilgilerek. We have just received word from the French Minister of the Interior that Diana, the Princess of Wales, has just died. This week in history, 1997, the world lost its most popular princess. A car crash in a Paris underpass took the life of Diana, the Princess of Wales, her companion Dodi Fayed, and their driver. Circumstances surrounding the crash remain a subject of debate and conspiracy theories to this day. We are calling for a non-violent, peaceful march on Washington. This week in 1963, Dr. Martin Luther King, fed up with discrimination and violence against African Americans, organized a march for jobs in Washington, D.C. A quarter of a million people showed up, including Bob Dylan, who performed with Joan Baez. The hour that the ship comes in. It was on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial that day that Dr. King delivered his famous I Have a Dream speech. I accept your nomination for President of the United States. This week in 2012, Mitt Romney officially became the Republican nominee for president at his party's convention in Tampa, Florida. Hurricane Isaac was bearing down on the city as the convention opened, putting a hold on activities for day one. The convention also featured a bizarre monologue delivered by Clint Eastwood to an empty chair. What do you want me to tell Romney? I can't tell him to do that. that. Can't do that to himself. This week in 1969, Bob Dylan made his first public appearance in more than three years at the Isle of Wight Music Festival in Wooten, England. Dylan had gone reclusive after his nearly fatal motorcycle accident in 1966. His return to the stage brought out a huge audience that included the likes of Eric Clapton, Keith Richards, John Lennon, and Ringo Starr. With This Week in History, I'm Jonathan Carl. This is AP News Minute. Rescue workers in Italy continue clearing debris after last week's earthquake. Officials said Sunday more than 2,500 people are displaced following the quake. Nearly 300 people died. In Aleppo, the battle for control of Syria's largest city rages on. People could be seen running and shouting in the streets after a recent bombing. The Syrian government and its ally, Russia, are the only ones currently operating helicopters over Aleppo. The hometown of an Arizona woman who was captured and killed by Islamic State militants now has a playground in her memory. The family of Kayla Mueller led the grand opening of the playground. A humanitarian aid worker, officials confirmed her death in 2015 after she was taken hostage by militants. It's called the Battle of the Brides. A small Russian town held its first ever competition between brides, showcasing their talents, from dancing to martial arts. It also gave the women an excuse to wear their wedding dresses one more time. Padmananda Rama, the Associated Press, with AP News Minute. Alex Powers uh, from Veterans City Africa joins us now from Douala, Cameroon. Sir, welcome to the program. How important is the battle uh, for Sirt in the uh, bigger picture in the overall war against ISIS uh, in Libya? Well, I, I think it's a, a good move forward, but I mean, I think we have to consider the whole broad spectrum and the, the whole history 
that we're, we're looking at right now in regards to, first, the, the murder of Gaddafi by, you know, cutouts from France, England, United States. Um, then you have the, the funding and covert uh, weapon supplying of all, all bunch, a whole bunch of different militias that has just raised the entire country, which was a beautiful, and now it's a disaster. So now that you have Hillary Clinton, who looks like she'll be in the White House, uh, now it looks like the Americans are going to really make a good push in killing off all the people they were basically supporting prior to get rid of Gaddafi and, and keep that area unstable and, of course, move into you know, Iraq and Syria as part of their, you know, their project. But, um, you know, I mean, I think it's, you know, on a day-to-day -day news story, it's good. But in the big picture, it's a very sad situation. I mean, you know, as a Pan-Africanist, you, you have to, you know, cry a little bit because Gaddafi, you know, for whatever whatever people say, he's a bad guy or good guy, he, was, he wanted to change Africa, which has been exploited forever, and he wanted to finally industrialize Africa, organize Africa, create a financial system that benefited Africa, because you know that that's the that's the real reason why Gaddafi was murdered. Is is the the reality is that he wanted an African currency backed by gold and other resources. The West couldn't compete. They simply can't. They would have gone bankrupt, and it would have changed the entire dynamic of this order that they have, you know, spent 300 years building. So. So that, that in, the, in the big scheme of things, is the real issue is, you know, is anyone going to finally step up and, and you know, deal with the fact that Gaddafi was a head of state and, and was murdered, and it was financed by, you know, France, uh, Britain, and the United States, and, and that nobody goes to, there's no international criminal court, there's no Hague, there's nothing. And you have Hillary Clinton basically admitting that on TV, national TV, they have ads where you know we came, we conquered, he died. I mean, laughing about it. I mean, it, it's it's unbelievable, frankly. And you know, I like like I said, I can't be a hundred percent supporter of Gaddafi. You know, maybe not all these you know dictators are pleasant people, okay? But in the big scheme of things, the Libyans were doing very very well. They had very nice infrastructure. They had good financing. They had most Libyans when they got married got fifty thousand dollars. They didn't have to pay back. They got education. They lived well, and comparative to Africa, they lived very well. And Africa was really benefiting from Gaddafi, and and it feared the West, and that's why they killed him. And so, so yeah, you have a win today for the West. Great. They'll put in their new puppet. They already have their new central bank. You know, and Africa is going to stay poor. They won't have their central currency. So they won. You know, that's my opinion. Thanks. Uh, vet from Veterans Today Africa, Alex Powers joining us from Cameroon. The Dehesha refugee camp near the city of Bethlehem in the occupied West Bank has been the scene of constant raids by the Israeli military forces since its establishment in 1949. But the recent attacks had a twist. They involved targeting the knees of Palestinian youth and children in the camp. The campaign was authorized by an infamous Israeli intelligence officer. We are facing a violent and systematic campaign launched by an Israeli intelligence officer. He promised to make tens, if not hundreds, of the camp's youth use crutches forever. In other words, to make them disabled. Then we noticed that in about a week, there were more than 17 cases of injuries in the kneecaps. Nidal Abid is one among many Palestinians who was shot in his leg for no reason. I was passing by when I heard that some people were injured by the Israeli forces. When I arrived at that point, a sniper from one of the rooftops fired at me with a fragmenting bullet. This bullet hits the body and then fragments leave nothing from your flesh. Of course, the other injured youth were also shot in their knees. Around 80 Palestinians with injuries in their legs now live in this camp. The injuries had been critical and almost difficult to cure. Even after receiving these injuries, the Israeli intelligence officers call the victims and threaten them with further arrests or injuries to their family members if they dare talk to the media. Atrocities committed by the Israeli forces, including shooting and maiming Palestinians, have left a generation of minors who need crutches to walk. Observers say the lack of international interference has led the Israeli troops to continue destroying the lives of these children. Hamad Hamail for Press TV, 
the occupied Edhesha refugee camp. James Jatras, former U.S. Senate foreign policy analyst, live out of Washington. Mr. Jatras, thank you so much for uh, being with us. So uh, given how the people of Kobani, the Kurdish uh, populated city in North Syria, uh, drove out Daesh terrorists last year, uh, what fate do you think will be awaiting Turkish troops if they enter the city? First, it depends on what the Turkish intentions are. The, the offensive the Turks have launched is directed against, they say, both Daesh and against the Kurds. But it's clear that the Kurds are the primary objective of the offensive. Now, the immediate objective, uh, as you mentioned, was the capture of the town of Jeropolis, which uh, the, the Turks are concerned that the Kurds not expand their zone to the west of the Euphrates River. That seems to have already been accomplished. Now, the question is, is how deeply do the Turks want to get dug in to northern Syria? And I think that's unclear. I think it would be a big mistake if they tried to, to basically stamp out the, the so-called uh, Rojava area that the Kurds have carved out. But uh, they, they may go too far. Um, yes, um, and uh, yes. indeed the Kurdish uh, people of uh, Kobani have made it quite clear that they are opposed to any Turkish action in their city. That's right, and I'm sure that they will fight uh, ferociously if the, Kur if the Turks attempt to seize it. But we don't yet know if that, what their intentions are. You know, the larger question, of course, is with whom are the Turks coordinating on this? Let's remember that the Kurds have been among the strongest uh, elements that the Americans have supported in this war. And it seems that we are acquiescing to the um, their being hit by our formal ally, a Turkish ally, who is a NATO member. It also seems that many people are speculating that this move of the Turks was coordinated with the Russians and the Iranians and even with the Syrian government, which has issued what seems to be mainly a pro forma objection to their incursion. Mr. Jatras, it seems that Turkey is uh, not wanted in Syria. The government in Damascus says Turkey's intervention is a breach of its uh, national sovereignty. And we had uh, the Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov saying yesterday in his press conference with John Kerry that there are certain countries that are undermining the government of President Bashar al-Assad by their unwanted military intervention in Syria. Is Turkey really helping in the fight? against Daesh with its apparently unwanted intervention in Syria? I think, I think it's, its actions against Daesh are quite negligible, actually. It's clear that the Kurds are their main problem inside Syria. As far as the attitude of the Syrian government goes, again, uh, they have objected to this, but it seems to me that it is more pro forma. There have been some very sharp clashes recently between the Kurds and the Syrian army. Uh, the Syrians Syrian army uh, doesn't mind the Kurds fighting against Daesh, but they also don't want to see the territorial integrity of Syria diminished by what amounts to an independent Kurdish entity. So Turkey is actually so, following its own interests by uh, moving, it, taking its troops inside uh, Syria and launching attacks? It is, of course, you would expect them to do that, and we'll, we'll have to see how extensive they, they, they intend this uh, this operation to be if they limit themselves to trying to blunt the extent of a Kurdish entity and don't get dug in further than that and are then willing to accede to Damascus's reassertion of control against the other terrorist groups operating against it we could be seeing a decisive shift in this war we just don't know yet at this point James Jatras former US Senate policy Senate foreign policy analyst thank you so much for your time and for talking to press <laughs>